Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get into the highlight of the panel, which will be the discussion with my uh, esteemed uh, guests here, we thought we'd just share some data on what's happening uh, in terms of investment in, uh, in, in ASEAN. There'll be a report that you can get on your way out as well. And let me articulate this in the context of, of chapters. I think chapter one, you know, however far back you want to take that, was frankly a little bit of a, of a slow start in terms of the investment activity that we were seeing in the region. And, and why would we say it was a slow start? Because as many of you would know, we are surrounded by very strong macroeconomic fundamentals, particularly in terms of the population, large middle class, and an average growth rate of you know, 7% or so over that decade, which is certainly amongst the highest we would have found in many regions of the world. But the investment landscape in this chapter one was rather sluggish, both on the early stage funding where people would get seed but struggle to get to you know, series B and beyond, and where PE itself was relatively sluggish. And there were a whole host of challenges, be it you know, uh, macroeconomic mismatch pricing expectations, lack of familiarity from business owners as to what private equity was all about, and the fact that local corporates in this part of the world had a significant amount of money and were competing against these funds. And then we got to the next stage, the next chapter, and where Singapore played a pretty important role in this, which was sowing the seeds for what this ecosystem, investing ecosystem, would look like. It became a hub for investors and business, and you certainly look, see that in many of the rankings that get posted around the region in terms of ease of doing business, number of startups, and so on and so forth. They were, across these markets, a large range of incentives that were offered to support this startup boom. And of course, we started to see very consistent deal flow. Three of the five largest unicorns were based here in, in, in Singapore. We were seeing Singapore as about 60% of the regional deal flow. The next chapter, I'd call that the startup renaissance. And though it receives press last year or this year, Actually, it started going back in about 2012 or so, which sowed the seeds for this startup renaissance in, in the region. And it's resulted in the things that we see, about 300 or so startups getting funding a year. You see Singapore is roughly half of that, but Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, certainly an important part of that as well. And that's resulted in these 10 unicorns um, that have been generated in this part of the world. Quite impressive you know, second only to Silicon Valley, China, and, and now um, India. Now, 2017 was a real breakout year for private equity. And, you know, a couple of my panelists are going to talk about that in more, in more detail. But, it, you know, PE kind of went off the charts. And there's a lot of, you know, data on this slide. What I have you pay attention to is that the red graph is so much higher than the great bars in all the other years. And effectively, we went from a five to nine billion dollar steady state market to a 15 to 20 billion dollar market, a substantial increase and the post GFC peak that we had in the region. A couple of other themes that I draw your attention to with data uh, before we get to the panel discussion is it's no longer just about Singapore. Of course, Singapore is very important and remains an important hub for deal activity in the region, but you see Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, all starting to count for 10, 15% of regional deal activity. Another question people often ask is what's happening in terms of sectors? And you can see that tech uh, is certainly now the lion's share of deal activity, accounting for almost 40% of deal flow in Southeast Asia. So where do we go from here? And what we're going to talk about in the panel in a second is we think we're now in a new frontier for investing in ASEAN. First of all, we think this landscape is accelerating. What do we think Southeast Asia deal value is going to be going forward, right? Is this a new normal that we hit last year? And in short, we think yes. And our prediction is that over the next five years or so, we should have roughly $70 billion of investment 
happening by private equity and venture capital funds in the region. If you do the simple math, that's about 14 billion a year. Not far off where we were last year, significantly higher than the five to nine billion a year we were having for the previous decade before 2017. What about sectors? What are gonna be the hot sectors? What are gonna be the hot markets? And I think our prediction is tech will singularly continue to be the largest sector for investment in the region. And in terms of markets, there's no denying that Singapore will play an important regional hub, but we're seeing a lot of interest in Indonesia and Vietnam. And it'll, it's, it's of you know, note that we have two of the panelists uh, on the stage who run founded and, and run funds that would have principal focus on those economies to talk about what's happening on deal activity in those markets. And third is the question, are we done in terms of unicorns? Has Southeast Asia created all the unicorns it had to create? We think absolutely not. That this virtuous cycle that has supported these, um, these unicorns will continue. And in fact, we think that there'll be 10 more um, generated in Southeast Asia over the next couple of years. So this is gonna continue to be a hub for the generation of uh, billion dollar valuation companies in this part of the world. Now, one of the interesting points is, as part of the preparation for this day, there was a matching system that you know about put in place where investors and those that were looking for capital kind of said what was out there. And what's interesting is, while there is a lot of money to be deployed, and we often talk about the capital overhang, it's not so well matched. And if I draw your attention to a few things, look at FinTech. I mean, this is the, the, the we are at the FinTech festival, right, around us. Plenty of money to be deployed and people who are looking for over $2 billion of FinTech investment. Relatively well matched, right? We think 70 to 90% of that can be funded. But look at something else like healthcare or education, right? Tons of investors who want to put money to work in those categories, but not a lot of um, money that is being uh, available, that's being asked for in those sectors. So you've got to look at where is there a mismatch. In aggregate, there's a lot of money, but where is the mismatch in terms of sectors um, seeking that capital? Now, as we look at these tailwinds that are, that are going to present a very attractive economy, what are some of the, the, the conditions that cause um, concern? Or we'd ask you to just you know, pause and think about. Drive carefully, as we say. First of all, let's not deny it is an expensive time to be investing in this part of the world, right? The average EV EBITDA multiples last year were about 17 times. If you look at tech, obviously it's a lot higher. This is the highest multiple that we've had over the last decade. You know, are we in for a macro crisis? I'm not an economist, but we all read the newspapers around us. What is gonna be the impact of tightening monetary policy, of the US-China trade war, of U uh, Europe deleveraging, of Brexit? Is that gonna have an impact on Southeast Asia? And we're starting to see in some ecosystems a bit of a winner-takes-all mentality, sort of like we've seen with the you know, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent in China. We're starting to see that a little bit here in Southeast Asia as well, where in certain ecosystems, the Grabs and Gojeks are, their ecosystem is winning quite significantly. And does that have Im impact on some of the startups that are coming around, around those well-established companies? So in our view, we think the smart money is gonna do a couple of things. Number one, we think it's gotta be about taking an ASEAN lens, right? Even if you're investing in a single market, what is it that your portfolio company or new startup can do to win across ASEAN, across borders? Two, we think talent is gonna be critical because as my next point will say, no deal right now in the market, and my panelists will talk about, is sort of a do-nothing deal. So do you have the right executives and the right talent to help you be activist with the portfolio companies that you're buying into? And last and not least, given the confines of the conference we're in around, how are you harnessing digital, both on a defensive basis to protect your incumbent business, but also on an offensive basis to take advantage of opportunities. There is very few businesses, we believe, that will not in one way or another be affected 
offensively or defensively by digital? And are you really taking advantage of that? So let me stop there in terms of prepared remarks, go back to my uh, seat, and now we're going to get the real experts uh, to give us their perspectives. OK, so, um, so Patrick, Patrick, and Don. Um, uh, it's, it's great to have a panel of uh, two very seasoned investors uh, with home markets in Indonesia and Vietnam, and somebody who started a lot of startups over the years across the region um, and gets to see you know, what it actually takes to make these businesses work. Um, Don, maybe I'll start with you first and ask each of you, before we go into some of the questions, to just, you saw my presentation, you know, top of mind thoughts on what's happening in the investment landscape across ASEAN. Uh, thanks for that. I think that's a great sort of summary presentation going to what we want to discuss. I'm more uh, focused on uh, Vietnam perspective. Um, our investment is mainly focused in Vietnam, so I'm just going to cover that space. Um, in terms of private equity, uh, I think the number show is correct because since early 2017 and 2016 for Vietnam, we have a lot of international global PE player actually coming in. For example, Wall Pinkers have put in, I think, over a billion dollars in the last two years into the Vietnam market. So we see a lot more competition from the international global PE firm that's coming to the region and again going specifically to country like Vietnam or Indonesia. And they are using Singapore as a base. So the headquarters for Southeast Asia is actually based in Singapore. So you do see a lot more global competition, but that's good because it's, it's, it's actually bring more uh, capital to the region. On the VC side of things, on the venture capital, I mean, we, we've been investing in this space for about 10 years. Uh, we're very happy to uh, participate in one of the first unicorn in Vietnam called VNG. And uh, a few months ago, we, we IPO a tech, media company on the Vietnam market. Uh, that's the first sort of tech IPO in Vietnam. Uh, so the market in VC, uh, uh, venture capital investment have been uh, more mature. Uh, that's what we see. And in Vietnam, we see a lot more native entrepreneur that actually setting up tech company. Uh, whereas 10 years ago, we see a lot of international regional company coming into Vietnam instead of tech company, but now we see more localized, more native. So going forward, I, I think there's a lot more of these uh, tech company that, that's coming up from Vietnam and their ambition really is go regional. And we invest three or four of these companies in the last few months that, that are all looking at going regional. So it's a very exciting time. Thank you, John. Uh, Patrick Walujo, I'll move, move to you next. Uh, Indonesia has obviously been getting attention for many years and we continue to see that. Perhaps your perspective running one of the most successful funds out of Indonesia. Um, thank you, Sumir. So we started our investment activities back in 2003. And back then, um, investing in growth um, in Indonesia was quite simple. If you find, had you found anything that shows it got a lot of potential, you just put in your money, and it will definitely make you a lot of money. Um, so early days in 2006, we invested in a convenience store called Alphamart. It had 1,000 stores. It grew at about 1,000 stores per year. Today, it has uh, 15,000 stores. It's a duopoly with another company called Indomart. So we sold Alphamart, and now we are in Indomart. Um, Indomart is also about 15,000, 16,000 stores. Um, in early days, we invested in, we took over um, um, a bank called BTPN. And we were very proud that in the first year, we opened 300 branches, and we still hold until today the record um, number of amount of branches open in one year that the gov that the that the regulator approved. Um, but things are not as simple today. Um, today, um, in Omart, when we made the investment two years ago, we were very proud that it was probably the biggest uh, transaction platform, retail platform in the country, about four million transactions done per day. Today, another company of ours in three years, a company called Gojek, is doing more transactions on a daily basis in Indonesia than Indomart. Wow. Um, um, but on the, other, on, on the other side, if we had the opportunity to repeat what we did at, at BTPN, we wouldn't even do it the same way. We wouldn't even want to open 300 branches in one year, even if we had the opportunity to do that. Um, because the cost structures, don't make sense anymore with all these new innovations, new technology, and how the market developed. 
um, we have to do things differently. Um, and we have been very active in financial services. Um, I don't want to, to talk, too, talk too much, but one thing that um, we learned is that it's easy to say one big ASEAN market as an investment decision, but every single market is different. Even in financial services, the landscape of the Indonesian banking industry is unique. It has the highest net interest margin, but it also has the highest cost to income ratio, right? We all know the story. Um, so in, 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 in Indonesia, I believe that um, in financial services, it's not about getting the, the, landing, um, the landing rate is there, the profitability is there, but it's really about managing your cost to income ratio. Your cost. Um, given all these, um, given all these um, dyna dynamics, um, Indonesia is not unique. It's not, it's not the first country that sees this whole thing. It had happened in China probably five years ago. And as a result, you see all kind of big Chinese investors in Indonesia. Um, and I think that I personally have more to learn from our fellow Chinese investors than any of our Western investors just because of the similarity of the trajectory that the, market, the two markets have, have, have gone through. Um, but it also attracts people who have made a lot of money in China. The Western names, such as KKR, Warburg Pincus, and all these names, they had, they had seen this um, movie played before. Um, so I think the, um, the, uh, the message is that, yes, I agree that there are a lot of things that are happening. We're also active in Vietnam, nowhere close to um, where Don is, but these two markets are very interesting. Where Singapore plays a role is that, I think you, will, you have heard and you will hear this theme over and over again. As these companies grow bigger and bigger, it's getting more difficult for us to attract talents, and it comes to a point we have to bring talents from um, other markets, uh, even from the US, China, India. Uh, it's easier for us to attract them to come to Singapore and work out of here, rather than, you know, not everybody is, to, is, is keen on braving the Jakarta traffic on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, and also the regulatory frameworks, all the incentives, as you said. So we think that um, we, 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 look at, uh, we, we look at Singapore as an integral part of the whole digital ecosystem. Thank you, Patrick. And we'll come back and pick up on a number of those themes, including talent and whatnot, in a few moments. So Patrick Grove, you've heard from the investor perspective, but now the perspective of the entrepreneur who's you know, founded a lot of these businesses. How do you see the investment landscape right now? So, so firstly, this is the first time I've been on a panel with two Patricks. So, uh, so thank you. Um, uh, th there were two things from your presentation that, that stood out for me and resonated. What, number one was, it's, it's absolutely amazing that more and more money is coming into Southeast Asia. And, and it's great. As a tech entrepreneur, I've been doing this since 1999. And you, know, and, and you need to fundraise all the time. So it's great there's more and more capital coming. But what is not so great is that with the exception of these two gentlemen here, most of the capital coming into Southeast Asian tech companies come from people outside of Southeast Asia. You know, so I'll give you an example. We have a company called iFlix. We've raised 300 million US in the last three years. 80% of that funding has come from either the US, Europe, or China. So what that means is that when you want to build a great business in Southeast Asia, you actually spend half your time on an airplane to Los Angeles or New York or London fundraising. And I, if I look at my own schedule in the next six days, it's KL, Philippines, Beijing, LA, San Francisco. And the sad thing is it's not to run the business, it's to find money to fund the business. So, so it's great that there's more money out there. I, I just hope that over time, more and more investors such as Don and Patrick see that there are great opportunities in this kind of world and you start to shift that balance so that you know, something like 50, 60, 70% of the funding in this region is coming from people in this region. So I think that's, that's key. Um, the second thing that I think is interesting is you said that there's about 10 unicorns in Southeast Asia and your prediction that is that there would be another 10 or 20. You know, it's, I agree with that completely. I think there's still so much opportunity in Southeast Asia. And if anyone here is thinking of being involved in a startup, either as a founder or an employee or an investor, I think you should definitely do it because there's still so much more opportunity in Southeast Asia. I, I think there'll be 30, 40, 50 unicorns in this part of the world in, in, in the next 10 years. And, and I'll tell you why I believe that so strongly. 
in iFlix, we did a survey of, of, of our users three years ago. And we said, if you could go to a deserted island, if you could go to the Maldives, we'll pay for everything for 12 months. But you could only bring your partner or you could bring your smartphone. Which would you bring? And, and pretty much, see, I can tell the people who are laughing are the people who would, who, who would bring their smartphone. 85% of people would rather go to the Maldives for one year, all expensive paid, with their smartphone. <laughs> It's kind of horrifying, but at the same time, from an investment point of view, it just shows how much opportunity is in this phone. It's not just for making phone calls. It's, you know, we, we heard about Gojek. With, it, it's for entertainment. It's for watching videos. It, it's for buying things. And, and there's still so many more things that people want to do with their phone. So, so I'm super, super bullish on the region. I think there'll be so many more unicorns. I just hope that more people from this region back entrepreneurs in this region. Thank you. You might have scared a few people off joining uh, tech businesses, so let me just say that travel schedule only applies to founders. Yeah, the rest of you won't have to go six countries in six days. So. Um, I showed some data around this new level of uh, deal activity in 2016 and 2017, and we're kind of predicting that that's going to stay you know, for, for many years. Get your perspective, Don, uh, both from Vietnam, but also you see a lot of stuff across ASEAN. Do you think this new normal, both on VC and PE, is likely to stay, this level of higher deal activity? And I also pointed higher valuations and all that, but you still think deal activity will stay at that level, or you have any concerns? No, I, I think the deal activity definitely increased, uh, in particularly, uh, especially in the VC space, uh, on the technology space. Um, for example, I mean, we, we just launched a new uh, fund called Vina Capital Venture, and once we announced the new fund, there are so many uh, companies actually in Vietnam came and see us. And within uh, two months, we are basically investing in five companies. And that's sort of like the same number of deals that we've done in previous uh, fund over two years. So definitely there's a lot more activities because I, I think there's more, more entrepreneur out there in, in, in within ASEAN and within Vietnam. Uh, there are people now understand that they can go out and raise new capital from third party instead of from mom and pop or families. I think those are the market's a bit more mature. So definitely to answer your question, I see definitely more activity, especially in the tech space. And uh, Patrick Walujo, uh, pick up on something that uh, Patrick G said, which is that he has to go around the world to get a lot of this money into the region. Um, your perspective, you know, are you still seeing the LPs coming in and investing in Asia, the traditional US and European LPs, or are you seeing more of the Asian LPs uh, you know, come into investors, come into funds like yours? From an institutional investor's perspective, it seems that most people are still underweighted Southeast Asia. Um, and therefore, any chains of allocation, portfolio allocation, will only benefit this market. Um, the, <coughs> the challenge is the shifting uh, view on emerging markets, generally speaking, um, given um, the recent developments. Yeah. And on the backdrop is also depends and on whether the current investors are making money or not one year or two years down the road, right? If, um, people are making money on their big bets, then it will, money attracts money. Uh, my worry is that um, if some of these bets are turning badly, or some of the um, portfolio companies are not delivering what they promise, then uh, we will see a lot of setback um, in the market. So this is uh, generally a fickle market. This is not a market that people must have exposure from a global basis. It's, um, Sorry to say, but it's, it's, it's relatively insignificant to global allocation. So it can benefit greatly when, 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 the, when the allocation changes, but it also can get affected very badly when, uh, when the mood sw swings. Can, can I just touch on that a little bit? Um, what we see is that, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we see a lot more from Europe and US LP coming to Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam. But in the last two or three years, um, the, the, the investor, the LP, coming in mostly from North Asia. We see a lot more Chinese investor exporting capital, we call it. So it actually, Chinese investor now actually putting money into Southeast Asia. And a lot more Korean investor. Korean investor being very, very aggressive, putting money into Southeast Asia. Japanese as well, but a lot slower. But the two area that I would say high growth is Chinese investor and Korean investor. 
Yeah, uh, Don, thanks for raising that. I was going to actually touch on that with, uh, with Patrick G that uh, we've seen in the private equity space, uh, you know, with these two other gentlemen on the stage, that a lot of exits are happening to North Asian investors, right? Japanese, Chinese, Korean, strategic, um, you know, buying in this part of the world. You talked about this having to go to the West to get funding. Uh, are you seeing some interest from these markets who are appear to be buying PE assets, or they're not so keen in, in looking at tech companies such as yours? I mean, I mean, what we're finding, and similar to Don, is that I'm seeing this huge explosion of interest from North Asian investors, and, and you know, whether it's Korea, Japan, or China, and, and more so China. And, and, and I guess what you're seeing is that, and similar to Patrick's point, is that you know, if, if you make money, then you're willing to respend and reinvest that money, and, and you're seeing these Chinese tech companies are creating so much value. And, and you know, it's sometimes it's not just the Baidu, Alibaba, or Tencent that, that everyone knows. I mean, there's 50 other tech companies in China that you haven't heard of who all have a billion US dollars in the bank and want to you know, plant the flag in Southeast Asia. And they're willing to write a check anywhere from 50 to $200 million if you are in a business model that they understand. So, so and, and, and I think that will continue because as the China tech scene continues to grow and get bigger, uh, and create excess capital, then you know a certain percentage of that capital will get redeployed in this part of the world. Patrick, I'll stay with you for a second. It, just continue if you don't mind. Um, you know, we're we're seeing tech. The, the the data shows that tech is a huge percentage of deal activity in the region, right? But valuations are high. You know, it, 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 some of the business models in this part of the world are not proven yet, and so on and so forth. So. Do you see, uh, you know, do you see that as being healthy, likely to continue? Any concerns on the kind of reliance on tech? So I, I've been in tech now since 1999, so that's almost 20 years. And every year that I've been in tech, there's always been a number of people who say valuations are high. I'm going to wait this one out, and and this and then, <laughs> and you know what? And I've never seen the tech valuations go backwards on a year and year basis. And you know, I remember in 1999 was the first time I met Jack Ma in Singapore. And there was a thing like, you know how there's the Oscars, there was a thing called the Internet Awards. It, it doesn't exist anymore. And we sat next to each other. And, and I remember someone said, hey, Jack, what's the valuation of your company? He goes, oh, $100 million. Someone said, hey, hey, Catcher, what's the valuation of your company? I said, oh, well, I don't know, like $30 million. And they go, oh, Alibaba, too expensive. Or like, well, today that hundred million dollars is five hundred billion dollars. So, you know, to the point, it's it's yeah. There's always people who think tech valuations are expensive, but if you can invest in a company, the right tech company that can build a moat and grow at fifty percent compounded year on year, I mean, I mean, I would pay anything for that kind of company. <laughs> you heard it. He'll pay anything for that kind of company. Um, fantastic. Let me let me try and bring in uh, some of the questions from the audience. We've got plenty more that we can we can turn to. Um, so one of the things that uh, the audience is asking is, uh, you know, given the unique characteristics of each specific ASEAN country, you know, what is it key to really understand in a market as you build a product that fits each of the unique market characteristics? So, you know, Don. Patrick as investors and, and Patrick as somebody who's building a business that is across companies, uh, you know, which one of you wants to go first, right? How do you, how do you be kind of regional local is kind of what the question's asking. Get the scale of ASEAN yet tailor for each economy. Who wants to take that? Okay, I, so I'll start out. We, we have historically always built regional companies and, and you know, it's a good question because I see so many companies get this wrong. And, you know, they assume that what works in Malaysia works in Indonesia. They assume that what works in Thailand works in Vietnam. And, you know, and, and one of the beautiful things and why I love this part of the world so much is that we're so different. The, the countries are so different. The languages, the people, the values, the food. And, and I think you need to constantly check your assumptions every day. And because and, 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 and it, it's so easy to say, Oh well, we're Asian. It's it'll it'll be the same in Indonesia. And you know what? More often than not, I'm I'm proven wrong that it's not the same. And I give you, iFlix an example. You know, we make a if we make a great TV show in Malaysia, even though Indonesia and Malaysia the language is something like 90% similar, Indonesians don't want to watch it, 
and if we make a great show in, in Indonesia, there's a very, the, the, the chances usually are that Malaysians don't want to watch it. And time and time again, we are pitched by producers say, hey, I want to make a great ASEAN movie or great ASEAN TV show. And there's always people in the company say, yeah, we should do it, we should do it. And, and, and back to this point, I think there's enough of us who've seen this before and say, you know what, I don't think it's going to work. You need to make a very Vietnam-focused movie. You need to make a very Indonesia-focused movie. And I think you just need to keep being hyper, hyper, hyper local every time. Just, just want to pick up on that very quickly. On our new uh, venture capital fund, um, one of the key criteria we actually put in for the investment committee proposal is that would this company be able to go regional? That's actually one of the five points that we, we need the founder of that company to answer, whether you can do it or not. And uh, a lot of the proposal that we saw from the entrepreneur is saying, look, you know, we can do 70% base, and there's always a 30% variable. So basically what they're thinking is that let's create a product or platform that 70% can be transportable through ASEAN, but every market you have to twist about 30% of it, or one-third. That's sort of the answer we, we hear from the interpreter. Interesting. So one of the challenges I raised uh, in, my, in my speech, um, and we see a lot of as we work with investors and your portfolio companies at Bain, is talent. Is it's really hard to find the right talent to scale these companies, to you know, prepare for digital, uh, to go across from one market to another and so on. How do you, uh, maybe start with the investors this time, Patrick, maybe with you, how do you assess and find this talent to help you scale these businesses? And, and then I'll, you know, at the end, come to you, Patrick, from an operator perspective, but let's start with the, the investor lens first. How do you assess talent? At the, portfolio, at the portfolio level, at the, company, at the company level, it all depends on the CEO. Um, I don't believe in great team. I believe in great CEO because a great CEO will build a great team. You cannot force a team to be put together around the CEO. Um, and talent is um, limited, especially in where we are operating from different, um, from different angles, from different dimensions. And it's more difficult when you get into more technical, deep technical expertise. And I would argue that when we talk about tech, there's actually a misconception that most of the companies in Southeast Asia that we see is actually not a tech company. It's a digital customer, consumer facing company. This is not deep tech. It's not deep tech, yeah. Um, and we look around for places that had seen these developments before, whether it's India, whether it's China, sometimes the US. We have diaspora, I mean, Vietnam has a lot of diaspora in, in, in Australia and in, in, in America, and attract them, to, attract them to come. But you know, it requires strong leadership because a strong, strong leader would, 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 would inspire and would attract all these, these talents to, to come. So I think there's no, um, there's no one single answer at the end of the day, the long answer, the, the long-term answer is that you need to start developing your own talent, right? But bridging that time gap, how do you how do, you do that? Um, and in the long run, there's no going away of investing, um, investing in younger people, getting them exposed, uh, send, them, them, send them to get the um, appropriate expertise and experience. John, uh, I know you spend a lot of time on talent as well uh, in Vietnam. What would you add? Well, you know, what we, what we normally do is when we do invest in a company, uh, similar to Patrick, the CEO or the founder of the company is the most important. So he or she is one of the team. So one of the uh, rules that we have is that we do not invest more than a certain percentage in the company so that the founder always felt that this is his company. So therefore, the founder always felt that they need to build and grow the company. So we actually outsource that part to the founder to find the right team. Um, we don't actually get to such a detail in a portfolio-based uh, company, but we do make an intention that we own smaller than, say, 40% stake or below, so that the founder is the one who's going to lead the process. And Patrick G, from your perspective, obviously you are the founder, but how do you how do you you know get others to align behind you, and how are you filing talent in across all these different markets that you operate in? Um, a, a good way to find talent is to sit on panels like this and ask anyone in the audience who's, who's an absolute rock star and one who works in the digital sector, 
ping, ping me on, on Instagram, and we are always, always hiring. Um, and but the other way is, you know, it's 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 a good question because it's not easy. It's it's always tell our teams that it's actually easy to find funding if you have the right plan and the right strategy. It's easy to find funding. It's it's easy to find a great idea to build, and and it's easy to find a big market. We, you know, we are in a big, beautiful part of the world. The hardest thing to find is the right people to go and deliver and all that. So it, it's it's not easy, and it, it's we are always looking, always. Thank you. Let me let me take another one of the questions from from the floor. Um, ASEAN is predicted to become the fourth largest uh, economy in the world by 2030, after the U.S., uh, China, and EU. In your opinion, what are the key areas of growth within ASEAN in the next five year, in the next three to five years? So, what what sectors or what themes do you think are driving this kind of ASEAN um, ASEAN growth? Who wants to go first? Uh, it's, 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 it's a tricky question because if you look at it from a macro perspective, um, you would imagine that generally speaking, ASEAN is a pretty young, got pretty young population. It has increasing income, um, and gen generally speaking, right? So anything that is consumer facing should be should should be growing very well, whether it's entertainment, whether it's lifestyle, whatnot. But recently, where we are operating, uh, we have seen some level of some, some changes in how um, all these sectors grow, right? So in 2017, for the first time in Indonesian history, the volume consumption of tobacco, carbonated drinks, and instant noodle went down year on year. Went down. Went down, right? Maybe there was a blip. Um, but it was the first, it, it, in 1998, at the height of the financial crisis, it didn't... Sorry, what were the three things? Tobacco, carbonated drinks, and noodles, instant noodles. Instant, instant noodles, right? Maybe it was like a one-off uh, um, one event. But in 1998, at the, at the height of the Asian financial crisis, those consumptions actually went up. Not, it, it didn't go, they didn't go down. But if you look at the dairy consumption, it went up by 20 plus percent. Um, we, have, um, we, have, um, we have a beauty chain um, which is part of an international group. Um, our Indonesian business had this best same source sales growth, more than 50%. If you look at travel, um, I think our friend from Traveloka can attest, um, the whole sector grows, grows very, very rapidly. Um, so my belief is that anything that has to do with lifestyle, that um, that got got affected by um, increasing income, prosperity. I think will do extremely well. So, Don, if I if I pick up a theme there, it's kind of health conscious, right? Is tobacco and instant noodles and all going down, and then we're going to spend it on more luxuries and so on? Is, is that does that resonate? Yeah, I, I agree with Patrick 100. Uh, percent I just want to focus on one specific area that we are very bullish. Uh, as people growing income. Uh, more health conscious lifestyle, spending more time, leisure time. We think tourism sector is an area that we're very keen. It's a combination of all, all of that, plus the discount airline is growing. Every country have discount airline now, so everybody's flying all over the place within ASEAN. But then you have a huge market from North China, especially China. The Chinese is flying south. So you have a combination within intra-ASEAN travel because of, of the income growth, and you have the Chinese coming south for the beaches and so on and so forth. I think tourism sector is a key that you area that you're looking for. Thank you. Um, Patrick G, I'll skip you on this one if you don't mind, because I want to get to another question from the, from the floor uh, and, and then uh, you know, wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, I know, you know none of us on the stage here are deep macro economists or whatnot, but it's, it's hard to ignore the U.S.-China situation right now with the trade spat. I think the question from the floor is, what is your perspective on how that may impact um, us here in ASEAN? You know, whether it's uh, new investments, it's existing businesses that you own, it's, you know, in, in Patrick's case, the businesses you founded and run. Are you, are you in any way concerned or worried about U.S.-China and its impact on ASEAN? <clears throat> We may or may not agree that this trade war will continue for a long time or not, but the fact is that the level of competition between China and the U.S. is only going to increase and it's going to be a permanent trend. It's not going to go away after the current president steps out of the office. 
And that, in some respect, um, based on my conversations with a few people, uh, put people on pause to look at their global supply chain and um, force them to hatch um, their geographic bets from productions. Uh, one country that has benefited, benefited most in this part of the world is uh, definitely Vietnam. I was surprised that the export number of Vietnam had gone higher than Thailand and Indonesia. I don't know whether you know that, but that, that surprises me, but they're, 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 they're an immediate beneficiary. Um, and I think this accelerates, I, I go to China a lot, and every single leading digital tech company that I met, when they talk about the international expansion, the first market they mention is Indonesia, without fail, every single one of them. Um, they, it's, 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 it's similar, it's close, um, they feel welcome. Um, so I think there will be a lot of um, um, movement of, um, of capital and production facilities, whatnot, from um, China to other parts of, of Southeast Asia. Um, and as long as um, the countries in Southeast Asia maintain good relationship with the US, maintain good relationship with China, with India, and we can actually benefit from this, um, this shift. Thank you. Maybe Patrick G, from an operator, entrepreneur perspective. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from an operator, I mean, I try to ignore geopolitics. I think at the end of the day, you know, I'm building businesses that are capitalizing on this huge, enormous growth in the middle class of Southeast Asia. And as long as this middle class keeps growing and is addicted to their smartphone and, you know, buys less soft drinks and less noodles, but keeps doing things on their smartphone, whether it's travel or e-commerce or entertainment, as this trend doesn't end, and as long as this trend keeps growing, then I think tech companies will continue to do absolutely well in this part of the world. Excellent. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Maybe I'd love each of you to give a, a closing statement. Um, and uh, Pat, uh, sorry, Don, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, you know, what advice would you have for people in the audience in terms of, you know, to be noticed by investors in the region? You know, what we've talked about what's happening, secular growth, ASEAN's attractive, whatnot, but what do people need to do to get noticed by an investor like you? Patrick, I'll ask you the same question. And then uh, for you, Patrick G, you know, people out there who want to start businesses, right? What should they be doing to start a business? But Don, I gave you, I gave you a little bit of a 20-second uh, okay. head start there. All right, <laughs> okay. I, I think if you're looking for funding, um, looking for investors like us who invest in the company, I think one is have a very, very clear vision of what you want. Uh, you know, when you come to see us, you, you don't have any doubt of what you want to be, uh, where you want to be. That's first. Second is that, like I said earlier, most of the company that we look at today they have to have a regional view, not just a Vietnam view. You want great valuation, you gotta think about you champion locally, but have an opportunity to go regionally. Thank you very much, Don. Patrick, without spilling the North Star secret sauce, what do you, what do you look for? I have not really written it in algorithm format, but um, um, I think the, and depending on the states of the company, right? For, for very early um, stage, um, I think Don hit the nail. Um, apart, from, apart from that, I think the passion um, for what he or she is building. Um, one thing that put me off is that when somebody starts talking about the amount of money that he's going to make or what kind of valuation that the company is going to fetch, um, because that, that, that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that what is it that you're building, what is it that you're trying to solve. Um, and then a humility as well. Um, you know, we need to make sure that um, the company or the founder can, can execute, but at the same time, got enough humility to know that there, there is unknown, unknown there. Um, not know, knowing that there are things that he or she doesn't know um, out there. I think that's, that's important. Thank you. And Patrick, final words from, from you, but uh, you've successfully, you know, created a lot of businesses to the budding founders out there. What, what advice would you give them? I mean, I was busy furiously note-taking in my head how to impress Don and, and how to impress Patrick. Uh, because, you know, my, my, my vision is one day I would love to build a great unicorn in Southeast Asia that is 100% funded by Southeast Asians. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you for your, uh, for your attention and your questions. Thank you. <laughs>